Well, Bio 121, we are now in the macromolecule section of proteins. And just a reminder that what we've done so far is we've taken elements plus some other element to make some sort of product. What we've done, of course, is we've gone through if we look at all of the different types of materials that are found in living organisms, we can break them down into four basic groups. We can have carbohydrates, C stands for carbohydrate, L stands for lipids, P is going to stand for proteins, which is what we're about to discuss, and then finally nucleic acids, NA. Okay, what we're doing, of course, is remember this is a ratio of carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. This is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And you're going to see here now we're going to primarily bring in another element that will help figure out the ratios. This is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, and you're going to see, even though we've seen that in some carbohydrates before, you're going to see that what we're going to do is we will now make sure that you understand why that nitrogen is so important. Okay, and that's one of the characteristics. What ultimately will it be doing in a series of chemical reactions so that we know that that product is and always will be a protein? So, proteins, these are the machines that are found inside of your cells, outside of your cells, inside the fluid of your body, inside the fluid of plants, inside the tiers of seagulls. Okay. I, mean, I don't know if that, that sort of gets it to the point for you that you un understand that they're the most abundant organic molecule. They have the diverse range of functions from regulatory, structural, protective, transport, enzymatic responsibility, as well as functioning to both become toxin-like structures, but also inhibit toxin-like structures. What do we mean by, by this? Um, we mean that there is going to have to be some set of materials that do the heavy lifting once we've actually built a basic structure, right? If we use carbohydrates as an energy source or a physical structure, or we use lipids as an energy source as a physical structure, you still need something to do the work. And that's what proteins are going to be doing, okay? They will have, how does a cell know what, it's it, what it is? And when we actually build a skeleton inside of a cell, which proteins will be responsible for that and how do they function? How is it your body knows um, to attack materials that are not it? Or for that matter, if you look outside at a tree and you see a burr on a tree, how did it know to build that burr around whatever that material was that was attacking the tree? How do materials transport between either one or the other side of a phospholipid bilayer or from one part of your body to the next part of your body. And you get the general idea here, I hope. Okay. We're going to look at enzymes for a couple of minutes here because <clears throat> when we're looking at what they're doing, remember the, tr the way I tried to explain it to you before is they facilitate chemical reactions. By doing this, what they do is they enable the biochemical reaction to occur at a specific speed for a specific substrate. And big vocabulary words here, meaning enzymes are specific to that substrate and nothing else. They will not ever work on something else. And if they are, they're breaking the rules and they need to be destroyed. And they will be. Okay. There are types of enzymes. There are catabolic enzymes, anabolic enzymes, and catalytic that affect, say, the rate of a reaction. Now, if we think about how we apply this definition, you would understand that hydrolysis now is a catabolic reaction if enzymes are being used. For us to build macromolecules, we use anabolic enzymes to build more complex molecules. And in a previous example where we actually had the maltose substrate, that maltase here, the enzyme, breaks down the maltose into two spe specific glucose molecules. Now, notice, relatively speaking, the enzyme is large. Notice, relatively speaking, the substrate reaction site is relatively small, and that's what creates the specificity 
that is used here so that you only get what Mother Nature needs at that specific time. So having said all of that, okay, what we need to do is we need to now examine what are the different types of proteins and functions. And here are some examples, right? So here's a type, example, and function. And I can tell you that there are more than 20-something thousand different types of proteins that can be found inside of the average organism. It's dependent upon the genetic material that's encoding those specific examples, okay? meaning the instructions to build a specific type of protein. Now, digestive enzymes, transport, structural, hormones, defense, contractile, storage, each of these will have a unique responsibility, and that's why we call it a type of protein. We think about, say, a hormone. Insulin is a hormone, thyroxin is a hormone, they are protein structures, meaning they're made up of the building blocks of proteins, you'll figure out what those are in a few minutes, and their function is to coordinate the activity of different body systems. Likewise, if you think about what a contractile protein is, contractile proteins are made up of specific examples of the actin, myosin, there are many more. But what they do is they allow for movement to occur, one of those characteristics of all living organisms. And that means what they're doing is they're causing the shortening of the distance between two points. And you know that as contraction. So. I'm not going to tell you not to memorize this table. What I'm going to tell you, if you're going to learn anything about it at all, you want to make sure you understand the types of proteins. I wouldn't go through all of these different examples just yet because it's more important you understand what they're doing. Digestive enzymes do what? Transport proteins do what? Structural proteins do what? Okay? And maybe you don't understand some of the words inside them. It's a great opportunity to start looking them up. How do we actually build them? Well, they're built from 20 different amino acids, and each amino acid has a specific set of functional groups centered around a central carbon. Okay, a central carbon, which is an alpha carbon here, has an amino group. Oh, look, there's that nitrogen. Okay, a carboxyl group, COOH. Okay, this entire thing here, right? You have this hydrogen, and then you have some R group, and that R group harkens back to our example where we use Lego blocks to describe how we will now attach that and imagine this is the base Lego block and anything you change here will change how this base Lego block interacts with other Legos. Now I told you there are 20 different common amino acids, okay? They each have a different R group or variant group and it's that R group that will actually determine the chemical behavior, the chemical nature of each amino acid. So it'll be nonpolar, so you'd imagine that they don't interact with water well. Polar interacts with water well. Positively charged is looking for negatively charged structures. Negatively charged is looking positively charged. And then you got this major nonpolar aromatic group here that's really responsible for a lot of the signaling responsibilities inside of our body. But you're going to see that primarily the size of this molecule determines who interacts with whom. Okay. So that's the grouping. So if we have 20 different amino acids, you should know that there are one, two, three, four, five different groups of them, and you're going to see how they're built. Now, if this is a biochemistry class, I would have you draw and name every single one of these. If you take bioinformatics with me, you will draw and name every single one of these, because you need to see how they're assembled. And in blue here, this is where you actually end up understanding how it is information is now sent or shared between different amino acids. So here's our nonpolar group. Here's our polar group, positively charged, negatively charged, and nonpolar aromatic groups. Notice what I meant is you actually had these really large structures, and lo and behold, I didn't lie to you. Now, <clears throat> for the purposes of this class, again, it's more important to know nonpolar, polar, positively charged, negatively charged, and nonpolar aromatic. How they work, though, is really important. Okay, You have a series of essential amino acids that must be supplied in our diet for humans, Okay, sort of similar to what we saw earlier um, when, we, when we're thinking about fatty acids. Remember, alpha-3 and, I mean, omega-3 and omega-6 amino acids have to be ingested. Likewise, essential amino acids here 
Okay, isoleucine, leucine, and cysteine, they have to be ingested inside your diet. So if you have a funky diet, let's imagine all you want to eat are parsnip sprouts. At some point in time, you will run out of isoleucine, leucine, and cysteine, and therefore you have to supplement that into your diet. Now, um, a few minutes ago, I told you that nitrogen is going to be very important for you to understand how all of this works. And I didn't lie, and you're going to find I tend not to. Okay, um, by using a dehydration synthesis reaction or an anabolic reaction, you're going to see that by using that N terminal hydrogen, so if here's our amino acid, our amino group here has a hydrogen, an oxygen, and a hydrogen here from that carboxyl terminus group, and we build this thing that's called a peptide bond. And that peptide bond in the process will release, in the formation of that peptide bond, we will also have a water molecule. Okay, so thus showing yet again, this is dehydration synthesis reactions that are now just becoming more and more complex. I guess you could say that reaction isn't becoming more complex. The consequence of the chemical reaction is creating more complex structures. A polypeptide chain is those that is made up of multiple parts, and the protein actually has to go through a series of steps to become a functional protein. And this gets its own chapter, the translation piece, as to how you actually make it. We're going to introduce it a little bit, but at the same time, there's, you know, I, I ha we haven't really told you how all of this happens, so I just want to introduce the idea. And you're like, hey, how do we know how to make all of these things? Well, all of the information for making what's required inside of a cell and inside of your body is stored inside the nucleus, inside the structure that's called deoxyribonucleic acid. And that information is then transcribed into, into some form of an intermediate. And that intermediate is messenger ribonucleic acid. And that messenger ribonucleic acid are the instructions for us to actually now translate so that we assemble the unique amino acids that are required. Each one of these A's represents an amino acid that will be required to build a new protein. Okay. So now let's review what that might actually mean, because the last slide here, you know, sort of tries to tie it all together. It might mean the last slide from chapter three. What this means is if you have a cell, and here's a nucleus, and inside of that you've got X number of chromosomes with all of the instructions to make sure this cell is functioning. The basic pattern is always the same. That DNA is transcribed into an intermediate, which is going to be mRNA. And that mRNA is now going to be the instructions for us to build our protein at ribosomes. Ribosome. We'll see what those things are in a few minutes. Okay, and by that I mean these are incredibly large structures inside of cells that will allow us to build or assemble the amino acids in the correct order. Okay, so yeah, you can watch this some flash drive thing here if you want to go look at it be my guest you can find many of them in fact I'm going to be putting some of them into your lab for you to figure out how it all happens because you will need to be able to tell me how it all happens at some point in time just not today what you do need to learn today though is if we've made our chain of amino acids let's do this we've made our chain of a that's not spelled right let's get out of here There you go. Okay. Um, if we made our chain of amino acids, this has to go from the primary structure of amino acids. Those were all those A's I was drawing for you a moment ago, right? Let's just put four of them here because it takes forever to draw all of this stuff out. You're going to see I'm going to change it in a second to shapes. Okay. Secondary structure is then going to be how they actually interact with one another. Imagine this one doesn't like that one, so it tries to move as far away as possible, but these two like this one, so they move towards it. Okay, the sum of those secondary structures, sum, sec, structures, in the correct environment, at the correct pH, and the correct temperature, will give us a tertiary structure. And this tertiary structure is the functional the functional structure meaning every single protein inside of your body that is doing a job right now 
or inside of a plant that's doing a job right now has to maintain a specific shape for it to be functional. If it's not in that shape, it can't do its job. Okay, and if it can't do its job, then it is of no use to the cell and it is destroyed. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you can't use something like pH or temperature to turn them on or turn them off. And in fact, that is a great deal of how these things actually work. And in fact, the pH may change the secondary structure, so the tertiary structure can now be obtained. And now that it's functional, you may learn that some, but not all, proteins require a quaternary structure. And a really bad example your textbook is going to use is hemoglobin. And that's because for hemoglobin, to carry oxygen inside of your body while you're eating something, C6, H12, O6, taking that oxygen to a subcellular organelle inside of your body that's called a mitochondria, which is where it's needed, okay? It's not needed anywhere else inside your body, okay? Now, that oxygen is going to travel here, but for it to actually get there, we needed to build a protein that had to be in a specific shape and that specific shape then needed to make, because we're, we're going to learn that some proteins actually require multiple subunits. And to do this, let's go like this. Imagine those are two protein chains, and these are two protein chains. Now, the reason why this is a really bad example is because you may think that, oh, it has four chains, therefore it's quaternary. No. Quaternary means that each one of these four chains has to be in its correct tertiary structure for it to fulfill its responsibility. And in this case, its responsibility is to carry oxygen. So once in its correct shape, it can carry four molecules of oxygen properly to where they need to go. And then, as I told you a moment ago, what makes it a good example is that now that it's gone into a specific area and the pH has changed, now you can let go of that oxygen so it can now go to that mitochondria. And that might be too much to teach you at this point in time. But the idea, of course, is you need to be able to figure out how all of that might work. Um, our secondary structure, the two major pieces that you need to learn here, okay, are what is an alpha helix and what is a beta pleated sheet. And that's actually how they form. Here's a beta pleated sheet and here's an alpha helix. And you'll see me draw these a lot for you because what happens is it's the behavior of the amino acids between one another that actually forms these. And tertiary structure is how they all interact. They're held together by a series of linkages, which are called bondings. And those bondings you're going to notice are either a disulfide group or a hydrogen bond. Okay, and these bonds are what actually are going to allow it to maintain that shape. A really good example of how this all works, of course, is when we're thinking about if you've ever fried an egg, you crack the egg open and you put it on a plate, and you'll notice the once translucent or transparent albumin now turns white as you cook it. And what you're doing is you're literally breaking the bonds in between these structures and now it changes the actual shape of the tertiary structure and it can no longer go back. <clears throat> now the last group are nucleic acids and these take a little bit more time so I'm going to pause here because I need you to spend some time thinking about the importance of what nucleics and nucleic acids are. You're going to notice I skipped over some slides here. The slideshow itself is going to be up on Blackboard for you to look, look at if you want to think about what I skipped over in terms of its importance. But what I try to do is explain to you how they work. Okay, and I want to make sure you can apply that information when you actually see it on a quiz or an exam. So we'll pick up here in a few minutes.